Go ahead, you guys, open up to John chapter 3. Tonight we're going to be looking at the greatest love story ever. John chapter 3, for those uh, visiting or listening online, welcome to the Refuge Center, a direct overflow of Calvary Chapel, Grants Pass. And what I want to go ahead and do, in a moment we are going to read the text, but I want to start with an opening statement. It may be tonight that we meet our maker. It may be tonight that you give an account for your life. And I don't mean to be morbid. I don't mean to be uh, heavy. But every one of us is going to meet our father. And so a couple weeks ago, I had thrown out a statement. I just want to go back and set the record straight to an extent. A couple weeks ago, I had made mention to some things that had happened as a child. Um, Now, it was afterwards that I had basically said these things, you know, these things happen, that someone came up to me and said, hey, I was sexually abused as well. And I was like, oh man, that, you know, that is not necessarily what I meant. There were a series of memories, uh, but I want to make it very clear before you as I have spent my life lying to, to make myself look better and, or lying to manipulate a situation for my good that I do not have any actual remembrance of being molested or anything sexual happening. And the reason that I bring that up, because all these things are neither here nor there, the reason that I bring this up, you guys, is our hearts should be settled before the Lord. That everything we say, everything we do, everything we live in, you guys, we live for truth. We live for God. And the question that I want to open with tonight, is your heart settled before God? Have you prepared to make, are you prepared to meet your maker? And so go ahead, because what we're going to look at, John chapter 3, and what we're going to go ahead and do We're going to pick it up in verse 16. We're going to read down a couple verses, and then we're going to go back. John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And whoever believes in him, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but who, I'm sorry, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. One more time, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You guys, God has desired the never-ending and fully hopeful eternal life for every one of his children. I'll say that one more time. God has desired the never-ending and fully hopeful eternal life for every single one of his children. You guys, let's pray and let's, Lord, just be, just take the lead. So Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for tonight. God, we pray that you just work out the details of tonight, God. Such a long week and so many variables, God, but it, your heart, God, I think about it being Valentine's. God, in your, your heart, God, this is the greatest love story ever told. God, that you reached out when we were in our despair. God, you have a plan for us, God. So I just pray for a night, God, that you would bless this time. God, that you would speak how you want to speak and you would speak in ways we understand. So we love you and we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, you guys, John chapter 3, the greatest love story ever told. As I said, God has desired that never-ending and fully hopeful eternal life for all. And the first thing that I'd like to state is that every one of us is going to give an account for, to God. Hebrews 4.13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to him 
we must give an account. Romans 2.16, on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, you guys. And we see that every one of us is looking for truth. Every one of us is looking for something greater. Every one of us, and looking at Nicodemus, what we're going to see because John chapter 3, and it is an exchange between Nicodemus and Jesus. We're going to see the rich ruler. And Spurgeon says about John chapter 3, he says, If we were asked to read to a dying man who did not know the gospel, we should probably select this chapter as the most suitable one for such an occasion. And what is good for dying men is good for us all, for that is what we are and how soon we may be actually at the gates of death no one can tell. You guys, and again, I don't mean to be morbid. I don't mean to bring up heavy things. But the question that God so often brings to my attention is have I, have I given myself to him completely? Have, have I surrendered? Because it is important, you guys, that we are saved by grace. That we understand, you guys, that we are saved by grace and that God is a loving God. God is a compassionate God. We see this in him reaching out. We see this in the gospel, that in the foreknowledge of God, he laid out the plan of salvation. He knew that we would walk away from him. He knew that we wouldn't be able to handle free will. He knew that if, we, if he gave us a choice, we were going to walk away from him. Yeah, if we can go ahead and maybe open the window or turn off the heater is absolutely, each week it's like a sauna in here. Um, looking at this chapter in short, you guys, John chapter 3, and I'm actually going to steal this directly from my father on when he spoke, but John chapter 3, looking at verses 1 through 21, we see the greatest tragedy, the greatest truth, the greatest text, and the greatest test. I'll say that one more time. The greatest tragedy, the greatest truth, the greatest text, and the greatest test. And my question for us tonight is whom will you live your life for? Will you live for the crowds and will you live for the standing, you know, the people exalt you and the standing, uh, you know, people cheering you on? Or will you live for God? Will you live for the applause of man or will you live for the applause of God? And so often the reason I bring that up is because as a point of application, someone's arm, make sure it's not mine, not mine. As a point of application, you guys, God doesn't care about our reputation. And what I mean by that is just because we have the ability to get through in life and people think we may be this or that, or people may think, you know, oh, we're so righteous or we're so holy or we're so talented. You guys make no mistake. You guys, God sees right through that. God sees right through that and he sees through it for the better, and he sees through it for the worse. And so oftentimes when teaching the kids, one of the things that once we've given our life to him, what's so comforting is in the immediate sense, sometimes it can be kind of scary in the sense that God sees everything and that we're no longer judged according to everyone else. But on the flip side of that, you guys, what's comforting is if I have given my life to God, and that I'm not judged according to those around me, I'm not judged according to society, you guys, that society has no hold on me. Whatever has happened in my life or whatever people want to bring against me, when people want to accuse or people want to bring things against me, or, or you know, we, we've had things happen in our life, I'm safe and sound in your arms. You guys, you are safe in the arms of God tonight. That he sees through everything in your life. He sees through the good and he sees through the bad. And so looking at this, we're going to go ahead. We're going to move up real quick to John 3, 1 through 8. And we're going to read it and we're going to set up a little bit of a backdrop. John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. You guys, my question, are you born of the spirit tonight? Because the first question or the first point of application that I have, you guys, is that every one of us is looking to be loved. Every one of us is looking, and that may obviously vary from person to person, but you guys, it, it, it's no, everyone is looking for acceptance. Everyone is looking for a safe place to settle their head. Everyone is looking for a place to, you know, to just be themselves, you guys. And it's important, you guys, that with God, we have that, you guys, because one of the things, one of the thoughts that kind of hit me as I was studying this is so often, and maybe it's just me, but so often I separate Jesus and God. And what I mean by that anyone in here a fan of baby Jesus? I know I sure am. I like baby Jesus. Baby, Je baby Jesus doesn't condemn me. Baby Jesus, he's safe in his manger. He doesn't, he doesn't speak on sin, right? But then when I think of God, I think of wrath. And I think of him up there waiting for me to stumble. You guys, make no mistake about it, you guys. It was God who sent Jesus to pay the price of our sins. God sent Jesus to pay for your sins. And the next time you go to make that move that you know in your heart isn't pleasing to the Lord, or the next time you go, you know, looking to make a move that you don't, you know, that you know that the Lord has already warned you about, you guys remember that, that God handed over his son. You know, I, um, at this point, I am not a father. Hopefully not for a couple more years. My wife tends to get baby fever, and I try to find the worst behaved toddler I can find to, <laughs> to, slow, to slow her, slow the process and slow the mind. But one of the thoughts that I was thinking, I, I, I do have a nephew that's about six years old, and he tends to be rowdy as most boys are. And one of the thoughts that uh, kind of hit me as I was looking at this passage and studying this passage is, you know, what, what must have been like, you know, for God to give his only son? Because I know that, that for my nephew, if I, were ha if I were to witness older boys harassing him, or maybe he broke a window or he did something, and the next thing you know, people were coming to my door and they were going to take my nephew away, and I knew that they were going to harm him. Guess what? I have one thought. Today is a good day to go to prison. It's a good day for you to go to the hospital, and it's a good day for me to go to prison, right? And I say that because think of the love that God has for us, you guys, and that he didn't give his son over to Christians. He didn't give his son over to people who were going to treat him with respect. You guys, he handed over his son for our sins for people who were going to abuse him. And so looking at this, the first thing that we see is that Nicodemus, you guys, he was searching. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, and it's been quoted when we look at the Pharisees. One author says, the Pharisees were an influential religious sect within Judaism that the time of Christ, in the time of Christ in the early church. They were known for their emphasis on personal piety. The word Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word meaning separated. Their acceptance of oral tradition in addition to the written law and their teaching that all Jews should observe all 600 plus laws in the Torah, including the rituals concerning ceremonial purification. He goes on to say, in the Gospels, the Pharisees are often presented as hypocritical and proud opponents of Jesus. The Lord stated it bluntly, they do not practice what they preach, Matthew 23, 3. As a general rule of the Pharisees, they were self-righteous and smug in their delusion that they were pleasing to God because they kept the law or parts of it at least. As Jesus pointed out to them, however meticulous they were in following the finer points of ritualism, they failed to measure up to God's standard of holiness, for you have neglected the more important matters of law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, you guys. And so as a point of application, you guys go ahead and pin this down. You guys, God has desired mercy over sacrifice. 
God has desired mercy over sacrifice. And th there's, there's a point here in which we want to see and we want to pick up, you guys, when we look at the greatest story ever told and we look at the fact that God gave his only son, you guys, that he did it knowing we'd walk away. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53.6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You guys, we need to take heart because as fallen as we are, you guys, God has paved the way. The word here for love, it actually, I'm sorry, to, to give, it actually, it's demio. And it means to give something to someone to one's advantage or to give a gift. I'll read that again. To give one something to one's advantage or to give a gift. And so you guys, we have to see you guys that the gift of salvation has always been a gift. You guys, the definition for believe here is to be persuaded or to place full confidence in. Where is your confidence tonight? Because so often, you guys, I find that my confidence is in what I can do. I find my confidence is in my church ties. I find my confidence is in the fact that I went to Bible college, and I was an intern, and I graduated by internship, and now I'm here, and I've been ordained. You guys, make no mistake about it. You guys, God doesn't care about your church ties. He doesn't care where you've been. What he's looking for is obedience in our life. And so on the, on the flip side, or, or in the immediate sense, while God doesn't care about my reputation, you guys, there's comfort in this. There's comfort in the fact that if he doesn't care about my reputation, you guys, he's just looking for me to believe on him. He's just looking for me to believe in him. You guys, and that should give you comfort tonight that God doesn't care about your ability to memorize scripture. God doesn't care how many times you've been to church in the past two months. I mean, yeah, the book of Hebrews tells us, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. We know that. But God, he's not looking at your performance. He's looking at your heart. And this gives me comfort because when I look at my heart, it's incredibly black and it's incredibly fallen. But we see that God has paved the way. God has already sent his son. And so wherever I go in life, I know that I can't earn my salvation. I can't lose my salvation. You know what that's like to get that through your heads and get that in your heart? When you stumble, you're not lost. When you make a mistake, you're not forsaken. When you lose your way, God will bring you back. Why? Because he sent his son and he knew that you were going to slip up. He knew he created a loophole from the very beginning. He laid out his law. He laid out his blueprint, but he laid it out with a loophole because he knew in the end you were not going to choose him. So he sent his son ahead of time that when you do not choose him, he has been waiting for you the whole time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. Man, if you guys believe it, you guys then believe it. Take the faith, walk with it, run with it, own it, make it yours. Because go ahead and mark this as a point of application, you guys, that the gift of salvation is bigger than your ability to lose it. I'll say that one more time. The gift of salvation is bigger than your ability to lose it. And for people like me, that's comforting because I'll tell you what, I lose everything. Ask my wife. I lose the keys. I lose the wallet. I lose her phone. I lose my phone. I don't know. I'm such a registered crackhead. I don't, I don't know where I put anything. And it gives me comfort, the fact you guys see Nicodemus looking at this passage. We see, you guys, that he was, when we look at this man, he wasn't, you guys, he was very morally sound. He was very morally tight. He kept the law, not only in the Pharisee, not only when we look into further study, not only do we see that he was most likely a lawyer, and he was also considered one of the three richest men in that area in that time, but he, what they practiced was the oral law, meaning six 
600 laws. It was the coded and amplified version of the Ten Commandments. And so they took pride in keeping over 600 laws. And so we see, you guys, that this man, if there was a man who was morally kind of loose or maybe morally kind of made choices that were questionable, this was, <laughs> that wasn't this man. This man was as close as you could get to falling in love. But God, Jesus, just like the rich young rule, he flips it back on him. And he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, I don't think that he was necessarily um, disrespectful. I think in a sense, you know, because we see, you guys, we do see that he, he was sincere in approaching God. You know, it says that he came by night. And some have said that it was because he was afraid. Others have said that he just wanted to have interrupted time with the Lord. Truthfully, we don't know. We don't know why he came at night. But what we do know is that the 600 rules he kept were not enough to provide peace for his heart. You guys, are you looking to the law tonight to be saved? Because if so, you will always be searching. And one thing, uh, you know, as it's Valentine's Day, uh, I actually found out I was teaching. I actually thought I got out of an expensive dinner, but my wife's all right through it, so we're going out tomorrow night. Um, Society has such ways of judging according to talent. Society has such ways of judging according to good looks, right? Where if you click on, well, the other day I clicked on the news and it, maybe it was just this particular news clip that I clicked on, but it was all about celebrities. I was trying to read about the coronavirus and it was all celebrities, what's going on in their life. I thought, good grief, this is the news now? But, you know, it, it, that's just what it is, that you guys, we judge in society according to how well we perform, you guys. And it, w- what comforts me about the gospel and about this passage, you guys, is we see that Nicodemus, he had kept 600 laws, but he was still empty, and he came to the Lord. And so Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, Eternity is penned on the hearts of men. And so what I see, you guys, is that every one of us is searching. Every one of us is looking. And so I ask tonight, you guys, is there, are you searching in your life tonight? Are you searching to be at peace? Are you searching to be settled before the Lord? Because go ahead and note this as an application. Don't ever, you guys, my question, what promise is self-righteousness keeping you from tonight? I'll say that again. What promise is self-righteousness keeping you from tonight? Because as a point of application, we see that pride gets in the way. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think there's an important lesson here that we need to not let pride and our intellectual learning get in the way. Because this individual, he kept 600 laws, you guys. And how often in our lives, you guys, when God calls us to do something, do we begin to rationalize with God? Do we begin to say, well, you know what, maybe, maybe I, you know, God's called me to this, so he's called me to that, but I don't think, you know, I, I don't quite think he'd be, he'd, he wouldn't tell me to do that. He wouldn't tell me to confess my sin. He wouldn't tell me to, you know, give myself up, you know, because how often, I know so often in my life, you know, and maybe this is just me because I'm a typical boy and I'm a typical schemer, but every time I've ever been in trouble, my very first thought is, what do they know? What does he know? What does she know? And I'm always waiting to see, you know, Tyson, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. You know, maybe they don't have nothing. Why? Because there's something built within all of us that we don't want to come to the light. We love our darkness because coming to the light, it's humbling. It takes effort. It takes dying to self. Will you guys live for the applause of man or will you guys live for the applause of God? Because there are some of you that God is leading you to repent tonight and you're pushing it off. There is some of you that God is leading to confess certain things and you're pushing it off. Because maybe, you know, you're thinking in your head, well, there's no evidence or they don't know for sure. You guys, pride will always keep us from the promises of God. I'll say that one more time. Pride will always keep us from the promises of God. And I look at at how far we've fallen 
in society and how far we've fallen away as a Christian church. This past week, I actually, I have an acquaintance. He's with a different church and him and I see different. We, see, we don't see the same uh, eye to eye in the gospel. And he's been inviting me. I found out that there's actually a group that goes outside Planned Parenthood, the abortion clinic, and they hold their signs. You know, and so I thought, well, maybe, you know, if they're holding their signs and they're being peaceful, you know, that's one thing, you know, but are they yelling at people? Are they making people feel condemned? What are they doing? And so finally, what I did is I went out to meet this acquaintance of mine and I stood outside from Planned Parenthood and the the, the time I was there, we were just, they held up their signs and, um, you know, it was quiet and it was peaceful. But afterwards, I found out that they had, um, Afterwards, I found out that they had been yelling at people, that they had been, you know, telling people that they were murderers for going to the abortion clinic. And, you know, and, and so what I did is when everyone left, you know, I remember Ravi Zacharias, the noted speaker, he made the statement that when we fling mud, not only do we get our hands dirty, but we lose ground. When we choose to fling mud, not only do we get our hands dirty, but we lose ground. And so what I did is I went in after everyone left and I said, may I speak with the manager, please? And as I looked around, most of these girls in there couldn't have been over 14 years old. And I asked to speak with a manager and the manager came to the front and said, how can I help you? And I said, you're going to find this funny but I'm actually a pastor. And I just wanted to take a moment to sit with you, whether it's today or whether it's next week, because I'd like to see how we've failed you, what we've done to offend you or maybe feel, make you feel condemned or, or you know, cast it out. And, and, and as I left, what hit me was not that God had given me the wisdom or the courage to go in and talk. It wasn't necessarily even, you know, um, the response of the manager, but what hit me was how young these girls were and how far we've fallen in society. How young these girls were to be 14 years old, giving up their bodies because they want to be loved. And I think of that, and I think of your typical boy will use intimacy to get sex in your typical, I'm sorry, a girls will use intimacy, right? And they'll give, they'll give up their bodies for intimacy. And then guys will give up intimacy for sex. And I, I see how twisted it is and how much we've fallen, you guys. And, and we'll go ahead. Um, C.S. Lewis, he actually goes on to say that there are only two types of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And to those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and consistently desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is open. You guys, God is not hiding tonight that he can't be found. And, 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 you know, and, and truthfully, um, you know, going through these things, I have other notes and I don't even think I'm necessarily going to hit. But what I do want to do for the rest of the time, I want to look at it just from a gift being given. We're going to look at the size of the gift, the time of the gift and the result of the gift. I'll say that one more time. The size of the gift, the time of the gift and the result of the gift. And I, and I think it's so interesting that in emptiness, we search among broken things for life. And I think of the passage when they, when they came to find Jesus and, and the angel told them, and he said, why do you search for the living among the dead? How often in our lives do you guys, do we wander through broken things and broken relationships because we're searching out truth and we're searching out true love and we're searching out that true peace. You guys, and we see that God, he looked down and he saw when we were in our worst moment, he reached out and he said, that one's mine. That one's mine. Uh, the, the, come, let us reason. Isaiah 1.18 Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. 
Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like Whoa. You guys, salvation has always been a gift. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, you guys. And so tonight in closing, Romans 5.15, but the free gift is not like a trespass. For if many died through one, one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many, you guys. There is no area which you cannot wander in which the Lord will not bring you back. You guys, are you feeling condemned tonight? Are you feeling like there's no hope tonight? Are you feeling like you're always searching for life among the broken things? You guys, look to Jesus. The result of the gift is that we see it cannot be paid off that he reached out to us in our darkest hour. The time of the gift, he reached out while we were still in the pit. You guys, God reached out while we were still in the pit. And the result of the gift, we now wear the robes of righteousness. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do, we're going to get ready to close, but I want to ask you, have you settled your heart before the Lord tonight? Psalms 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. But he said to me, Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that, it, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Why? Because when I am weak, then he is strong. And that strength is completed in me and it's perfected in me, you guys. And so the key point of application, you guys, is in him giving his son. You don't have to search anymore for peace. You don't have to search anymore for life. It's been given in the Savior. And he looked down on you and he said, you were worth going to the cross for that if it was just you, he would have gone to the cross. Why? Because he despised the shame that was put before him. And so I think of the gospel, and I think of the fact, you guys, that Jesus corrected his sincerity. Because sincerity, you guys, we can be sincerely wrong. And we can never mistake sincerity for spiritual understanding. And see, Nicodemus, he had the 600 laws down but he didn't know what it was like to simply give his life over to the Lord and follow him. You guys, there's freedom in following the Lord tonight. And so I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to invite anyone. If there is anyone in here that does not know where they will go. You know, we, we, we will interrupt. We will stop this service right now. We will pray for you. You know, God forbid Calvary Chapel Grants Pass goes anywhere without, not, without giving the gospel, without giving the opportunity for, for someone to come, you guys. And so search your hearts tonight, you guys. And this isn't meant to be in a negative aspect, you guys, because God is love. And so often in my life, I mix that up. I forget that God is love. I look at baby Jesus, and I look at Jesus, and I see that he's compassionate. But I look at God, and I see that he's wrath. But you guys, it was God who sent Christ. It was God who paved the way, and he paved the way when you were in the pit, you guys. And so we now wear the robes of righteousness. And so the brokenness in this world, it won't be fixed through politics. It won't be fixed through medical devices or more knowledge. This has been proven. You know, we, we've only gotten more and more knowledgeable. And guess what? We've only fallen further and further away. You guys, what we need is Christ. And what we need is a settled heart before him, knowing that all of us will face him. All of us will give an account to God, but it's funny that people, you guys, they go everywhere. People wander all over the world looking for peace. And the whole time it was here in a little inky dinky at the refuge center. The night peace came down and freed your soul. 
Are you tired of striving? Are you tired of always trying to work out your life or figuring out how things are going to play out? Are you tired of always just being pushed down into the weight, you guys? God has the answers, and he has the rest that we desire. He has the peace we desire. So let's close, and please don't leave without getting prayer, you guys. So often I do see myself in Nicodemus, not so much in the sense that he was successful or talented, but he, he was someone who thought that salvation could be found through conduct. You guys, salvation has never been found through conduct. Yeah, there is a level in which we need to walk in holiness, you guys, but your salvation, it rests in the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, he took your darkest sins and he took your darkest deeds and he took the worst areas of your life and he casted them as far as from the east is to the west that you might have eternal life. And in, uh, looking on the word eternal here, not only does it mean forever, but in looking at the word eternal, the actual root meaning of the word means substance and hope. Substance of hope. So not only does God desire that we would live the rest of our lives with him, exploring his love for all the ages to come, but John 10, I have come that that they might have life and life more abundantly, you guys. God has the substance we need, and he desires that we have hope in our lives. So let's pray, and you guys just be blessed tonight, knowing that you guys are loved, knowing that there's no place you can wander where God doesn't see you. And while that can be scary, you guys, it should be incredibly comforting that he doesn't, when when he looks at me, he doesn't see my errors. He doesn't see my mistakes. He sees the blood of Christ and he sees his son in me. So Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, that you'd continue to work out the rest of that message. God, that you would just straighten out the details. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just, God, if there's anyone in here that's lacking peace or lacking direction, Father, that they they wouldn't leave until uh, we get a chance to pray. God, or even for those listening online, God, that they would take the time to get down on their knees, God, and cry out to you. God, as your word says, no one who looks to you will ever be put to shame. God, so we love you. We thank you that hope is found in you tonight. God, that it's not found in relationships. It's not found in society and culture. Guys, God, it's found through you. It's found in your son. God, so we love you. We thank you. We ask that you just bless the rest of the night, God, and speak in ways we understand. We ask these things in your name. Amen. God bless you guys.